Ed. Hey. Good to see everybody. Uh, the wonderful team in the back. If you go ahead and go to the second slide where it says six pandemics, or the third slide that is, let's put that up and make that our introductory point. We'll jump around just a little bit. So, um, you know, we now that COVID is uh, hopefully behind us, now keep in mind that you remember July 7th through 11th last year when we were done with COVID last time? Uh, I really missed July 7th through 11th, and it was all fine, and, you know, we were, we were supposed to have over people over for a barbecue, and then... And then like Delta, and then after that, you know, Omicron or whatever. So I got, I was actually in New York City. Uh, I was the interim of this church in New York City, Calvary. And I, it was the last weekend of the year that I was going to be there. So uh, I brought my daughter down. She's the, the musician from Canada. And we met in New York City. And we had a uh, wonderful time. We planned to go to shows. Whoa, there's me back behind me. All right. That's not creepy at all. Um, <laughs> So, um, so we went and, and uh, you, saw, you actually saw where we were on the global news because you remember when the Rockettes shut down because they had the COVID outbreak right, right at the end of the year? We were standing in line for the Rockettes when they came out and said, we've had a COVID outbreak and shut down. And then they shut down seven shows that day, made national, it was on the front page of everything. And uh, so we snuck into one, two shows before they closed down, and then they closed down the next day, and they were all gone, and then I got COVID while I was there. So came back, had COVID, got Delta. So I kind of feel a little foolish that I'm so out of style, I got last season's COVID, you know, so not even Omicron, but Delta. So I had Delta. So Christmas, I'm locked up in my room, and uh, did fine. I made, made it fine. I will tell you, it was funny. I, I made it out. I made it through fine. It was never, I always had mild symptoms. But if you have it, some of you will experience I had, like my brain didn't work for about two to three weeks. It was the strangest thing. I couldn't remember things. It was the strangest thing. Um, but one of the things we're, we're seeing is that, that in the midst of the cultural convulsion that I talked about last night, uh, we're going through a series of pandemics. It's not just a pandemic. And I go, and people, well, I got opinions about COVID, and I, I think we should have, and I understand. We all, we, you know, we all have different views. I, I've been unapologetic about my views, and you're allowed to have different views than me. It's actually allowed, right? So we can all say people have disagreements on some things, but, but here's the thing. What we're finding is, is that the complexity of this moment is multifaceted, and we're experiencing a lot of pandemics. There's a pandemic of disease, right? And there's a pandemic of distrust in culture, right? Um, everyone now seems to distrust somebody or something else, right? So do your own research. It's, it's come to your own conclusions. Don't believe so-and-so to a level that this, this tends to accompany cultural convulsions. In the 60s, uh, they made their own newspapers, so they wouldn't read the newspaper, right? So it was actually, you know, printed on, you know, those machines, what was it, lithographs, whatever those things were called back in the day. Paul, what were those things called back in the day? At the disco. Stone tablets, right, exactly. So they put them on stone tablets at the disco. Um, so so we, we see, we're seeing that, a pandemic of distrust. Now, it's not just that. It's a pandemic of defamation from technology, right? So you're uh, one Facebook post away from just people going at your church, someone leaves your church, uh, you know, being, you know. And, and what's fascinating is, is people believe stuff that's just posted uh, online, you know, because, oh, they can't put it on the Internet unless it's true. And, and, and I want to tell you, be, be discerning about these things. Be discerning about these things. Uh, disorientation in identity. We've talked some about the identity issues already. Over at that magical table by the bathroom, I, there's, a, there's the National Association of Evangelicals magazine. I, I, Andrew McDonald and I wrote the cover story of, on that. And it talks about evangelical identity. So identity, multifaceted conversations, right? So who am I uh, as an evangelical? Who am I as uh, a, a Latino? Who am I as a... Uh, as a person of color? Who am I as an Anglo? Who am I sexually? Who am I gender-wise? Everyone's asking questions about who am I, and it's a great time of disorientation. Disruption to mental health has been huge. I, I don't even think we know how disruptive the last couple of years in particular will be to children and more. I mean, it's, it's going to be generational in its impact, um, the disruption to mental health. Division in church um, is now, again, I, I'd be interested to hear, because I've never preached at a church in Wyoming. I have never preached at a church in Utah. And yes, that is a hint. So it's like when my wife came home one day, I got this really nice dress. What, should we go somewhere? Of course we should go somewhere, honey. Um, so, you know, I, if you need somebody and you're in a nice place in Utah, call me. Uh, I'm done with my interim. But the, the, um, the, the challenge is 
So I don't know what it's like in everywhere. And rural, rural contexts are different than, than, and southern contexts are different than northern contexts. I mean, it's just different in all kinds of different places, all kinds of different ways. But um, I just, maybe by a show of hands, how many of you found the last two years to be the most divisive time in your church, in your lifetime? Raise your hand. Okay, all right, so it's, so it's everywhere then. So, um, and so this division in church. So we, we went through, um, if you remember, we'll just review quickly, PowerPoint folks will be writing in the back. We went through COVID and our cultural convulsion, right? We talked at, about how America's having a moral convulsion. We so, cited that David Brooks article that talked some uh, about that. Um, and then we talked about waking up in 2030 where the sudden acceleration of these cultural issues, he specifically talked about race and how people view race through different lenses. We talked about COVID and the great sort. Uh, last night where people are now sorting themselves ideologically into churches rather than based on their theology. I gave the example of technology being a great cause of this was this lead pipe. And I made the, the claim that, you know, tech, social media is a lot like that lead pipe. We talked about COVID and layers of disengagement. And if you remember, I talked about the third, the third, the third. This will help you, the third, the third, the third, because you want to be asking the question, how do we get the more committed, to the first third, to engage the second third who are not more committed, help them be more committed so you can go out and find those who were once loosely connected and now have completely disconnected. So here we are. Here's where you are. Here's where I am. So I, I like the phrase, and Christians have used this for 2,000 years, Esther 414. Who knows, perhaps you've come to your position for such a time as this. So here we are. This is where we are. We didn't pick this time, but we're walking through, and I want to dig a little more this morning on a post pandemic missiology, a post pandemic missiology. So I'm a missiologist. So where might we go and what might we do? Now, depending on where you are, you adopted some level in the last two years of a temporarily deficient ecclesiology in the emergency for the sake of the mission. I'm interested because I, I've not in, yet in person met somebody who pastored a church that did not shut down, at least during the two weeks that President Trump shut down. But I know there's 4% of people are, and they were disproportionately rural. Uh, now, again, people say, you know, John MacArthur, you know, made national news, but he shut down during the shutdown. So did, did any of you, and I guess no, no judgment, because you might, you know, you might have been totally where, you might have been in that town with one, per, one person. So having church is you. Uh, did any of you not shut down during the two weeks? See, I've never seen yet anybody not do that. Okay, so all of us at some point adopted a temporarily deficient ecclesiology in the emergency for the sake of the mission. So temporarily, uh, keyword, um, I, I'm guessing, well, is anybody not meeting yet? I'm assuming we're all meeting. Okay. Now I mentioned if, when you're in the north, it can be very different. Like Moody Church, which I think all of you would know that Moody Church is more conservative than, than, than you, probably. Uh, they didn't meet from shutdown until Easter 2021. Over a year, right? I think it'd be over a year, right? A little over a year, yeah. So I was so I was the interim for four years, and they they shut down from then. And so I actually finished my interim during shutdown. So uh, they invited me back in August. I'll preach again there this summer. And in August, they did a nice little goodbye thing for Donna and me. And when they did, they um, uh, I actually was preaching that Sunday. So I said, "It's so great to be back." You know, Moody was meeting again. Moody, by the way, is about half the size it was. It's about fifty percent back. And I said, um, so I put up a picture on the screens, and I said, this is what it looked like when I began as the interim pastor at Moody Church. And I put a picture of Easter. You know, there it's 3,750 seats. You know, it was all full. Warren Wiersbe used to say, come in, grab a seat, any seat. They're all equally uncomfortable, and they were, these hard wooden seats. So the church was just packed. And I said, this is what it looked like when I started as the interim. And then I said, this is what it looked like when I finished as the interim, an empty, completely empty building with a camera up front. And, and, you know, because I finished in shutdown, they called their new pastor, who's a converged pastor, by the way. So uh, Scott right out came to the installation service. He's a, uh, a, cons uh, a pastor from, that Philip Miller's his name, Philip Miller. By the way, he also was a student at the Wheaton College Graduate School. Did I mention that? I'm not doing a plug, but I'm just saying that all your friends are students at the Wheaton College Graduate School. Doing, our DM, doing a DM in with us like you could. Um, so <laughs> call now. The operators are standing by. Um, and Bethel's wonderful too. Um, so, so, um, so all this kind of takes place, but Moody is, doesn't meet for all this time. 
and, and, and partly it's because people have responded differently in different places. But all of us said, we're going to do temporarily deficient. Now, some pastors were, um, like, like Rick Warren said, you know, the church never closed. And I actually disagreed with Rick, and I said, I think that's the, and again, he's doing just fine without my opinion. Uh, but, um, but I said, I think that's the wrong language to use. I think the right language to use is, is that, um, and everyone did. So again, there, there's no judgment for everyone made this decision. Whether you did it for two weeks, most did it for at least two months. Uh, and then people, you know, Denver was pretty bolder. I mean, there were harder places to open. I said, what I would, what I prefer people to say is, is that, because pastors were always trying to make a positive. It says, because of the emergency, we're going to be temporarily deficient. We're not going to be all that we're supposed to be. And again, your elders walked through and thought through the best time to restore back. And we did it for the sake of the mission. But at the end of the day, something substantive is gone, missing, and needs to come back. Because I think what we taught people, and here's my concern, what we taught people is it's okay that you don't have people gathering together in worship. Online's just as good. Online is not just as good. Biblical community requires feet and faces, not just electrons and avatars. You say, Ed, what about online church? Well, I, again, I, those are two words I don't want to put together. I want to, I want to have online streaming. I think, I think that probably that day is probably going to continue on until some of you get tired enough of people taking clips out of your sermons in a culture that's moved on on issues of morality and more, and they, they, you keep showing up on someone else's blog as talking about life or talking about marriage, and then people might stop the streaming. But, um, but, but here's the thing. I think in, in the emergency, some people, in the way of being super positive, because that's what pastors are, we're super positive that we made it a goal. You know, we want you to engage online as a goal. Online shouldn't be a goal. It should be a tool. And the goal should be people in biblical community. So I guess I'm cautioning you too that moving forward, I really hope that you don't have uh, online members who are living in Australia who don't have any connection or community with the life of your church. I think it requires feet and faces, not just electrons and avatars, with the exception of people who, people with disabilities who, and, or, or people what we used to call shut-ins, not the best language today, but homebound, whatever term you want to use. So with those caveats, where do we go forward uh, as a church. Now, Paul, I forgot to ask, how long am I supposed to take? It's 9.02 now. What time do you want to be done? Give me a time. Don't say as long as you want to. Oh, my gosh. I can't ever get a freaking answer. Is it always like this with Paul? Oh, I do have my podcast. That's true. My podcast. Yes. That was, actually, that was, worth, that was worth your snarky comment. Uh, so what time am I scheduled to be done? 9.30, okay, good. So I'll go to about 9.55, and then I'll go to my podcast uh, after that. After that, If you want to listen, by the way, it's on Salem Radio and 150 other stations live. Anthony Bradley from King's College is my guest on my little podcast that airs 10 o'clock live here. And by the way, worst weekend of the year, Pastor. Someone give me an amen. You know why. Time change Sunday. Yeah, and I'm preaching here which means there's going to be nobody at the first service. They're all going to show up at the second service. Do we have two services at this church? The pastor's not even here. He's sleeping in. Three, three, sweet mother of pearl. I, I'm doing three services and one tonight? Well, thanks. Two tonight? Well, if you don't know, don't participate. <laughs> Help me out here. If you don't know, just kind of let someone else give that information. Okay, I'm going to move on. Somehow I have been tricked in a lot of services. So let me give you a couple of principles that I think are going to help us navigate a post-COVID missiology. So here are the principles. Uh, elevate your ecclesiology and engage the mission. If we could put those there on the screen. Elevate your ecclesiology and engage the mission. So I'm going to talk about this, building some on my conversation from last night. So um, elevate your ecclesiology, engage the mission. What is ecclesiology? Well, ecclesiology, if you went to a big fancy seminary like Bethel, you would know that ecclesiology is the study of the church or the theological understanding of the church. Um, I think one of the things coming out of COVID that we need to do is to teach God's people just how essential church is. We live in a world where people sort of see church as a consumer product. Uh, there was an article recently in the Religion News Service saying that the long strike possibility of baseball is teaching people not to go baseball games, but to watch it on television. 
but it was in religious news service, so they said baseball and churches. So I believe that the disruption of not meeting uh, is one of the biggest things we will look back from 10 years from now and say how it depressed church attendance at such a significant level. Now, um, again, don't, don't think that I, I mean, I wrote an article before President Trump shut down the country saying, if you're in a high spread area, you might want to consider pausing to meet. Um, and I got a lot, of, a lot of letters about that, and that's fine. I get letters a lot. People handwrite them, like for 22 pages of handwritten letters. It is what it is. Um, so I believe this time is a time for us to engage God's people and to say, we need one another in community. It's going to get harder to be a Christian. Cultural forces are going to be stronger. I believe you've got to emphasize this in your student ministry, where students are awash in new ideologies, new directions, new, uh, new ideas that are contrary to the word of God. And we've got to build our institutional churches. And I use the word institutional. We need to value this experience in a time when the world is pushing another way and it's seeping into the church as well. So one of the ways you can be countercultural is to care deeply that people would be in a gospel community called church. That really matters. Now, again, we live in a world where people shop and bop. And what happened is, is they, you know, they couldn't go to the baseball game, so they quit watching baseball. It's a religious news service. Similarly says they couldn't go to church, so they quit engaging their church. And I will tell you, my, my church was shut down for, I don't know, maybe four months. You know, it was six weeks was kind of like the president's decree. Um, and we, we went on, made a month or two longer. Um, and I will tell you that my wife, who's the most godly woman that you'll ever meet, um, she, she was just done with online streaming. Like, like at about, we were all trying to be supportive. And you got, she got about two months in. She's like, I don't like this at all. And let's just read the Bible and pray together. Okay, well, and I actually, I mean, deep, we're deeply committed to church, right? So we still connected. We listen to sermons maybe by podcast or working out. But sitting there Sunday morning at 10 a.m. watching this was not engaging us. And so we moved to an asynchronous experience. So we were listening to our pastor's sermon on podcast, spending time in worship another time. And at the end of the day, I think millions of people walked that direction. And unlike us, who are deeply committed to the church, saw that as a, an off-ramp into their church from their church involvement. So I think we need to emphasize our clear theology. I think you need to teach people that being in this community called church, there are 30 commands in the New Testament you can't do unless you're in a deeply rooted community. How can you bear one another's burdens when all you're doing is looking at somebody on a screen? Push against the screen, says the man who's on two screens with a picture of himself behind you looking at a screen here. Um, elevate your ecclesiology. Number two, engage the mission. So if I'm correct that the front third got more engaged and more involved. Matter of fact, let's do some, let's do some surveys here, if you, if you don't mind. Let's talk about your giving for just a second. How many is your giving um, either at or above, have you raised your hand just a minute, at or above 2019? So in other words, if your 2019 budget was, say, $100,000, it's 100,001 in 2022, or your giving is a, at, doesn't have to be like, could be the same, could be the same $100,000, at or above 2019 levels. Raise your hand if that's you. Okay. How many are you below 2019 levels? Okay. So much more of you at or above 29. Now, again, for those of you who are not, uh, could, again, these factors can be complicated. It may not just be what I'm talking about, the third, the third, the third. But I'm deeply thankful as someone who for the last 20 years has been writing books about how churches need to leave the building and need to be on mission and be missional Right? Well, in one Sunday, every church in America left the building. Now, that wouldn't have been my choice, right? But every Sunday in America, the church left the building. And we felt this surge of mission. So my church, which might be like your, I mean, my church is kind of feels like this church, right? Uh, with the exception of like the Christmas lights outside. Everyone really understand the Christmas lights coming in, the, the red and green Christmas lights. I want to say ding, 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 ding. ding. Um, so, but same kind of idea, same kind of vibe. We have big coffee area outside, coffee shop. So we closed all that, and that became a food pantry. Uh, where I live is a lot of refugees. Uh, DuPage County is one of the leading refugee resettlement areas. Uh, suddenly, they're just, you know, everything's, you know, broken off with the supply chain. And our church just stepped in and began to minister. So our church turned into a ministry station and has really kept some of that, right? The front third is engaging the mission. We're still trying to get the front third to engage the second third. 
the second third are still not fully in. Maybe they're at the same level they were in 2019. There's a lot of people who come to church as customers of the religious goods and services, consumers of the practices of the church. The front third has become co-laborers in the gospel at a highest level in, that I've seen in my lifetime. I need the second third to start reflecting more the first third. And I think the opportunity coming out of COVID is, is to help them and our church to say, how are we all in? So I'm actually doing a series at Central Wesleyan Church in Holland. It's a, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a Wesleyan mega church there. Um, and my, the series I'm doing with the pastor, we're doing a six-week series. It's all next week, I'll be there. Uh, the series is called Our Finest Hour. How is this going to be our finest hour? And we're calling that second third to step up, stand out, stand in the gap like the front third, and let's go on mission because we've lost the back third and the world remains lost as well. So, and then that back third is going to be partly how we engage that mission. So, so we're elevating our ecclesiology and we're engaging the mission are key things for us moving forward. Now, again, um, I, I, there, there's Winston Churchill had a phrase, never let a good crisis go to waste. I don't know, I would put this in the category of a good crisis, right? We, we've seen over, soon to be over a million people uh, die with COVID in some way, form or fashion. Um, we all know people who have, we all know people who have. And, but, and what I would say in the midst of that is that God is not surprised and his people need to stand up, stand out, stand in the gap. If we're going to see some of the awakening that I hoped for, talked about last night, it's going to be because we, in obedience to Christ, stood up, stood out, and stood in the gap. Now, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that took place uh, in, after 1968 in the Jesus People Movement, right, was, uh, was often limited to young people. It was often limited to young people. Um, it was much more, it, it wasn't particularly diverse. When we, we actually gathered this fall at Biola University. Someone here was a Biola student. Who's the Biola person last night? Biola, for the win. You're doing the demon, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so we partnered with Biola University with their Center for the Study of the Life and the Work of the Holy Spirit today, the longest named center in the history of academia. Um, and so we partnered with them to do a reunion of the Jesus people. So we did a, what's called an oral history. So we have 60 interviews. You can go to jesuspeoplemovement.com. If you remember, you'll want to go to that, right? Jesuspeoplemovement.com. And um, we interviewed almost all the living leaders of the Jesus People Movement from the late 1960s. Now, we were going to do the reunion in fall 2020, but these people are all like 70-something years old. And the idea of bringing a bunch of 70-year-olds to Southern California in fall 2020 seemed it would end badly. So we, uh, we, so we, we put it off a year, and we did the reunion this year. And again, some of you have to be old enough to remember, but we, had, uh, we got Salt Company, we got Nancy Honeytree, we got two or three members of second chapter of Acts. We got um, Chuck Gerard. We got Melody Green and all the musicians. Then we got Greg Laurie and some of the leaders of it. And you know what they kept saying? They kept saying, it feels to us like 1968 again. That's, I didn't pull that out of my ear that I think 2020 could be a repeat of 1968. They said it feels to us like 1968 again. And so in the midst of that tumult, it's an opportunity for us to engage the mission. Um, and we're going to engage the mission by through church planting. Um, we've heard several things today. And one of the things that why, why Converge is my backup denomination. And really at any moment I could get kicked out of my own. So you're my backup. Um, so one of the reasons is because is your engagement in church plan planting is, is one of the bright spots across different networks and denominations um, is your engagement in church planting. We're going to need more, not less, church planting. And this could be a great season of church planting coming out of COVID. Um, now, let me, let me say, too, that I've written a couple books on church planning, one called Planning Missional Churches, co-authored the most recent version with Daniel uh, M., and then there was the unfortunately named book Viral Churches. So in hindsight, it was very clever when it was published. Warren Bird and I wrote it together in hindsight. Um, to be fair, um, Greg Steer, who lives here in the Denver area, wrote a book called Outbreak. Doesn't seem so clever now. And... Uh, and last time I was in town, also a local Denver person, a Mark Middleberg's book, uh, Contagious Christianity. So none of those <laughs> stood the test of the last two years. So, uh, but anyway, so elevate your ecclesiology, engage the mission are going to be key, key areas for us to, uh, to walk through. So let me talk a little bit about some of what's going to be missiologically some of the headwinds headwinds coming out of COVID, right? So there's a picture of a dude, we'll put the slide up. Um, 
walking into the headwinds. So I flew here from Chicago, and they said we're going to be here so and so early, such and such time early, because uh, we've got good tailwinds. So, so the somehow you know the jet stream is maybe slowed or, or lower. So I got here early from Chicago to Denver. Um, those are tailwinds. Headwinds are when you get you know you get in the same plane going home, and if I got good tailwinds, I'm probably going to get bad headwinds. So my guess is my flight back to Chicago will take 20 to 30 minutes longer. So there's a resistance that comes from certain things that I want to talk to you about today, kind of on multiple uh, multiple occasions. What these headwinds are. So here we are coming out of COVID. Um, and again, we don't know. I think, I think if there's another variant, I don't think, I think people are sort of done regardless of what happens next. And, uh, and, I, and I would just encourage you to lead still through and remember that people are still experiencing um, sickness and more, uh, and you can minister to them through that. People I think are going to debate for the next few years about uh, whether we overreacted by shutdowns or not. Uh, I've got my opinions on it, probably not relevant for today. Um, so, but, so COVID's still going to be a thing. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of us learned a lot about the Spanish flu in the last few years. So um, the Spanish flu, of course, came through and uh, mortality rate was um, much, much higher. And it also killed people. It killed little children and people in their 20s. It had to do with how it reacted to and created an immune response and, and older people as well. Um, but one of the things that I did early on during COVID, you know, I did that little Facebook Live from my basement um, that some of you engaged. But after that, uh, I started doing some research. How did churches respond during the Spanish flu? And because I was serving in Moody Church, I could actually get that information. At that time, Moody Church was very close to Moody Bible Institute. Still close, but in 1918, 19, it was like super close to Moody Bible Institute. I mean, almost like overlapping in some ways. They're actually two separate organizations. Moody Church today is more reformed and Calvinist. After 37 years of Erwin Lutzer, who's a five-point Calvinist, it sort of moved that direction. There you go, there you go, it was predestined. Um, and uh, where Moody Bible Institute is, would say they're more dispensational. Anybody wanna praise God? Well, not so much. Uh, more dispensational, but still Calvinist in, 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 in soteriology. So, uh, but then they were closer. So I actually pulled, uh, for some reason, the Wheaton record, which has been published by the students forever, we didn't have any record of the Wheaton record news, newspaper that the students published during those years. But we did have from Moody Bible Institute their, their, um, their publication. I don't remember what it was called um, at the time, but we had records of the publication. And we would read, and it was like heartbreaking, because every week there'd be who's, wh who, which among the students died. Because remember, it was like, imagine all the college kids were the ones who were dying of COVID because that was happening in Spanish flu. So the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. That's an important thing to remember. The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So what happened then? Well, um, Moody Church didn't shut down. I was, very, I was very aware of this when I was preaching in Easter 2020 to an empty room at Moody Church that a hundred years before, who would that be? Would that be Paul Rader? Uh, that was preaching at Moody Church, and they didn't shut down, but people, people have known for a thousand years that getting near people when they're sick makes you sick. They didn't know about germ theory or, or what a virus was a thousand years ago. So Moody Church attendance went down, uh, people distanced, them, distanced themselves and did all of those things. A um, couple things happened during that time. First of all, worth remembering, did anyone know when the Spanish flu ended? Anyone remember? 20, I mean, uh, 1920, some might people say. It actually ended in 1957. So there's no Spanish flu today, uh, but it ended in 1957 because another virus came on and bumped it out. So there's not a Spanish flu today. So it really was pandemic for a while, and then it became endemic, and people learned to live with it. So when you got to 1922, Spanish flu was still around, but by the time we got to 1922, Moody Church was back to normal. So Predictive, you know, again, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I work in a nonprofit organization. Um, it takes about 18 months for attendance to reset itself, if it does. Now, I, I, I don't see the same patterns here. I think we may really have lost the number of people that we think we may have lost in the last few years because they were loosely connected. People back then were less loosely connected. They tend to be more in, and they came back in 18 months. So I still don't think, though, we're back. Because let me give you an example. Um, who here has plant, 
planted a church that had a big launch day. Raise your hand if you planted a church that had a big launch day. All right, so several of you. So, you, so I'm going to use you as an example, right? So you planted a church that had a big launch day. So uh, what's the name of the church? New Hope. And where is it located? Lehigh. Lehigh, Utah. Good. I'm preaching for you at some point, right? Okay, good, good. I got a Bible. We'll travel. We'll not bring the book Viral Churches. So uh, New Hope in Lehigh. All right, so you planned a big first day. And you invite, you had a core group or the launch team, I think, and, you know, Converge is too cool to call a core group. It's a launch team. Um, and you had a lead team guiding you. So you had your first Sunday. Now, did it rain on your first Sunday? If it rained on your first Sunday, would that have been a really bad day? Yeah. Because, like, all these people that are, like, very nominally interested, might come, thinking about it, um, one rainy launch day and you got half the attendance. And you'll be like, I mean, have anyone launched a church when you had rain on that day? Anybody? We did. We did. We were planted. We, we planted a church that had 234 at the first service. Then the next church had 244 at the next service. Then the next church had 261 at the church service. And then we planted another one and it rained and it had 100 people on the launch day. It's like rain on your launch day. Don't start dancing, Paul. Um, why? Don't want you to miss this, right? Unchurched or loosely disconnected people are one easy excuse away from not coming to your launch service. Can I tell you? Take that by extension. Unchurched or loosely connected people are one easy reason to not come to your church, period. And they've had two years of the easy excuse in their lifetime. Really? I mean, let's say, well, I don't think it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And all kinds of people say, I don't think it's a big deal. And they'll go pack in line at Kroger and they'll go to, uh, to a movie, but it's like, oh, church, it's during a pandemic. You feeling that? You tracking with me? So emphasizing our ecclesiology requires a few things to think about. Let's put that slide up. The first thing is shrinking nominalism. The first thing is shrinking nominalism. So there's less people every year who call themselves Christians but are not engaged and involved in your church, what we call nominal Christians, right? Your number one evangelistic pool is nominal Christians. It's people who say that they're Christians, um, maybe even think that they're Christians, and it seems weird to people, but part of our job is to help them understand they're not Christians so they can actually become born-again Christians, right? You've done this. You've got Easter, you're saying, let me tell you what it means to be a Christian. You've got to repent of your sin. People are like, well, I haven't done that. You've got to receive. You've got to be born again. And people are like, I haven't done that. So I wasn't a Christian. So literally almost everybody in your church, not everybody, but almost everybody in your church who says, I became a Christian on such and such date, actually referred to themselves as a Christian before that date. They just understood what Christian was and was born again on that day. So that's our biggest pool. 50% of Americans, now it's different in different states, but 50% of Americans use the word Christian to define and describe themselves, and it is not a particularly meaningful part of their life. 50%. And I'm not talking about like devout Catholics who use the word Christian to describe, I'm not talking about Mormons who increasingly use the word Christian to describe and define themselves. I'm talking about people who use the word Christian to describe and define themselves who are, could be Mormons, but they're nominal, like really nothing. But they use the word Christian. What do we do? We try to explain. This is what the gospel is. This is how you respond. And they might receive by grace and through faith the good news of the gospel. So that pool is shrinking by 1% to 2% per year. So 1% to 2% per year of Americans stop using the word Christian to describe and define themselves and say, I'm really just nothing. This is the story of my family. So my family, when we grew up, I grew up on Long Island, outside of New York City, in a nominally Catholic home. The Catholic Church was really the church we didn't go to on Sundays. And my family would refer to themselves as Christians. Today, most of my family does not use the word Christian to describe themselves. Their behavior hasn't changed in 50 years. I'm talking about my uh, older than me. Their behavior hasn't changed in 50 years. They haven't been involved in 50 years. But for 30 of those years, they called themselves Christians. And if they went to church on Christmas and Easter, they went to the Catholic parish. About 30 years ago, they even quit going to that. And now they would just say, I'm nothing. That's the fastest growing trend in American religious identification today. And the more they describe and define themselves as nothing, the more they move away from any openness to the good news of the gospel. There's an evangelism crisis right before us right now. So the shrinking nominalism means, because it is harder for us to reach devout atheists, devout Mormons, devout whatever. 
it is harder to reach because they it's actually where most of our evangelism comes from is people who think of themselves as being generally open to christian things yet not being born again followers of jesus so shrinking nominalism is key second go to the next slide as well is attitudes towards proselytizing uh, here's the thing. People today are increasingly negative towards sharing the gospel. I was on a radio show in New York City on WABC, their flagship station. I guess it's the number one weekend show, and it's called The Rev and the Rabbi. So it's A.R. Bernard. Some of you would know A.R. Bernard from Christian Cultural Center, African-American pastor, and a very well-known rabbi. So the rabbi and I are talking. Uh, you know, A.R. Bernard's been representing, this, you know, representing the gospel well on the show. And he says, you know what I don't like about evangelicals? And this is how all, so many of my conversations begin. And I said, what, Rabbi, do you not like about evangelicals? He said, we're always trying to convince me I need to become a Christian. And I said, yeah, that's kind of a thing. It's kind of a thing. Matter of fact, evangel is the root of the word evangelical, to tell the good news. He says, but I don't, you know, I don't want to. And, and a matter of fact, I'm really concerned that Christians would try to convert Jews. I said, I said, that has significant historical things. And I, say, and I said, I definitely agree that there's complexities in the Christian-Jewish relationship. And I think Christians have, have had, you know, there's been anti-Semitism. There's been horrible crimes. Uh, and I also think that because we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and in our place, that it doesn't exclude anybody. It includes the Jewish people and it includes the, the, the Pokot in Africa and the Ebon in Malaysia, that everybody needs the good news of the gospel. He said, okay, well, I think it's fine you think that, but do you have to tell everybody all the time? I said, yes, actually, Jesus told us to tell everybody all the time. He literally said, go make disciples of all nations. And I will tell you, having a conversation on a secular radio station with a rabbi who's unhappy about it is not the easiest place to talk about the uniqueness of Christ. But it's necessary that we stand up and out for this. I'm, my most read article before the Oral Roberts University article was an article that CNN let me write. You can actually find it if you're interested. Let's just type in CNN Stetzer and um, why your Christian friends keep inviting you to church. So they published it on Good Friday and made a little like package of it. Not like just the, the little article, but there was a little picture of a church with somebody standing in the upper right-hand corner and millions of people watched, read it. And it appears that millions of them were mad at me. <laughs> what kind of, are you telling people to harass us? And I said, you know, it's coming from a good place. We believe that Jesus' death on the cross for our sin and in our place. And this, this Easter, we believe he came back from the dead, new life for all. And, you know, I got to share the gospel in this CNN article that they put on the very front page. I'm going to try it again this year because I'm part of the He Gets Us campaign, which everyone will be talking about in just a matter of weeks. Everyone will be talking about in just a matter of weeks. Is the smoke machine actually on right now? I'd like the non-smoking section of the stage. Wow. So the Lord said, <laughs> sorry, little ADD, squirrel. Um, but here's the thing. I'm going to really try to defend proselytizing, evangelism, we would call it, but the world calls it proselytizing, in the pages of CNN again, knowing this is an increasingly controversial and people are increasingly hostile towards the idea that we believe the gospel needs to be shared and needs to be shared with words. People love putting up Francis of Assisi's quote, Preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. There's only two problems with that quote. First, he never said it, so there's that. Remember the words of Abraham Lincoln, don't believe all those quotes attributed to me on the internet. Remember Abraham Lincoln. And number two, it's really bad theology. The gospel is good news that needs to be expressed in words in a world that is negative towards proselytizing. Next slide, next slide. We'll keep, we'll keep walking through because I'm going to be running late and I can't be late for my little podcast. Accelerating cultural shifts. I've already addressed that some, some of the accelerating cultural shifts, um, and so I won't spend too much time there. But it's as if in 2020 some people just stepped on the gas. And it's kind of all around us. And I would say to you, let me just say to you, please realize that what you're experiencing church is people coming to you with questions about how they should respond to this. And, but what other people are experiencing is things that their, their jobs are on the line for their Christian beliefs sometimes. Um, their family relations are, are in a difficult spot because of these things. So these accelerating cultural shifts are very, very challenging. 
Also, next up, the image of evangelicalism, the image of evangelicalism. So part of what I'm today working on this article um, that will run on, I think sometime next week, it's called um, Evangelicals and Ukraine, Not Russia. Because the media is constantly trying to portray us with some of the more fringe voices. So you saw a couple of people who called themselves evangelical saying, saying, you know, we're inside of Russia. We're, you know, we this, this, and this is a holy war. And, I'm, and, and, and yet they end up, and they're like, they're like really fringe people. You wouldn't even know some of their names. I actually say that. I quote some of the people that ended up on the front of CNN's page. And I'm like, nobody I know knows this person's name. And you're saying this is an evangelical leader. So, but the image of evangelicals was a hard place. And I think, and part of what I try to do is to speak into that uh, on a national level. But let's talk some about the tailwinds, and then I'll, I'll wrap up in just a few minutes. Tailwinds coming out of COVID. Um, there are some things that are helpful, right? The spiritual hunger right now that people feel. Here's the deal. If you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe if you are a follower of Jesus too, I mean, the last two years has just crushed any thought that you had that we're going to evolve into some sort of wonderful utopian reality. If we're just all super woke or super engaged and concerned about every issue, if we're all just super engaged with everything the world tells us to do, it'll just all be great. And everyone's like, no, it's just not. The modern experiment is failing. It's just not holding. And there's a spiritual hunger in people that I, I want to invite people to understand and respond to the good news uh, of the gospel. Next, next up, we're going to go through these quickly, is um, the failure of the modern experiment. It just, it's just not working. And I think that's hard for people to acknowledge, but it's nevertheless true. Uh, next is, um, uh, is a deployment for mission. We actually have, at a higher level than we had in 2019, the front third of the church. Now, part of it, you have to help them to engage in evangelism right now. And we're, I'm part of a group that's going to help you with that. When I, I was talking to my kids recently, and I have three, three daughters, and one of them was smart Alec. I don't know where she gets that. Um, and we were talking about luggage, and the wheel on our lo- my, my uh, rollerboard broke. And I said to her, like I do now because I'm, I'm old, and I said, well, you know, when I was a kid, that's what you say. When I was a kid, luggage didn't have wheels. We lugged the luggage. Right? I said, I need you to carry this. You need to lug this luggage. And. And my youngest says, so wait, you didn't have the wheel when you were a kid? (laughs) Right. I felt, I totally tossed the softball. She hit it out of the park. She said, no, we had the wheel. But somebody had not yet thought about putting a wheel on the luggage. Or here's the thing, right? Boxes, right? There are boxes. Um, When I was a kid, boxes, you had to hold them. Now they make hand holds in the sides of boxes. Which like, why didn't somebody think of that? When I was a kid, I mean, it's so much easier. They think of those little banker's boxes, little handholds, you carry them around. It's like, so here's, here's what I think we've got to engage. You're, most of your pastors and church leaders, you need to give your congregation handholds to do evangelism in an increasingly hostile time. Don't just throw the box at them and say, you got to tell people about Jesus. Uh, that's part of what we're doing with the He Gets Us campaign. So everyone's going to be talking about, I mean, it's going to be all over the place. Again, it's the... $150 million. And some of you, because you live in this area, you saw, remember the Mormon commercials? You know, uh, you know, I'm a Mormon, I'm a Mormon. And they put up, you know, the guy on a motorcycle or a guy or a woman in a business office, I'm a Mormon. Which ironically, now they don't want you to call them Mormons after they spent like $100 million telling you they're Mormons. It's, they really got to pace their revelations, but that's another story for another day. Um, so you saw that. And I had all times people say, why can't Christians do that? Well, here you go. It's about to start. Literally during March Madness, these ads will run. There'll be a takeover of Times Square. You ever seen where Times Square, where all the screens say the same thing? They're going to be a takeover, hegetsus.com. If you're interested, go to hegetsus.com for the ads or hegetsuspartners.com. He gets us partners for that. So we're going to give handholds, right? Because right now people need this because there's an increasingly negative perception towards evangelism. And we need ultimately a great renewal of evangelism if we're going to see the kind of outbreak we want to see. Let's talk about just a couple more things real quickly. Um, the tumult and the opportunity. You've noticed I've kind of camped on 1968. Now, I, I don't remember 1968, um, the, uh, but some do. And you remember the tumult you felt personally. And don't miss that. Christians today and pastors, church leaders, If you find yourself in a crisis, this is the right time. 
We've already had someone talk about this today, and Paul can help direct you. If you're in crisis, you need to reach out and get help. Counseling is good. Getting help is good. Now, not, every, not everyone's going to need counseling. Being in community with people who care for you and walk along this is good. I mentioned, so I was, beginning of COVID, we were launching coronavirus in the church.com with Saddleback and Purple Peace Plan and Rick Warren and the Humanitarian Disaster Institute. We were, we were working 16 hours a day. Again, we got a little head start on this because I was having a meeting with, this, with the Surgeon General, uh, Jerome, uh, Jerome Adams, at the time. He was uh, he's back in Indiana now, but he was the Surgeon General in the Trump administration. We had a re uh, relationship. And so we had an early jump saying, this is going to be a big deal. They're going to shut down things for way longer. And he, when people, we always talk about two weeks. The Surgeon General was not thinking it was going to be two weeks. So that's, if you watch that video I did, I said, this is going to be a long time. Um, and people got mad at me, but it turned out to be a long time. Now, again, you can decide how you felt about how people responded, but it turned out to be a long time. Uh, Andy Crouch wrote about this. And if you remember, Andy Crouch said, some of you thinking this is a snowstorm, and that's kind of a two-week snowstorm. could be a big snowstorm. Some of you think it's a blizzard. It's going to impact you maybe three or four weeks. Some of you think it's going to be a winter. It's going to impact you for a season. And he said, no, this is a little ice age. This is going to have ramifications that go on for a long time. Now, again, you might say, well, COVID seems over. And for some of you might say it was over last year. Um, but the ramifications are still here. We're still dealing with lower church attendance. We're still dealing with the people in the back third not coming. Um, but at the same time, it's in the midst of tum tumult and turbulence that people are questioning everything. And to quote a song from the 70s, Jesus is the answer to the world today. Above him there is no other, Jesus is the way. So um, I don't know all of what that looks like. Remember, in the past, these outpourings tend to take place outside of the local church uh, or outside of local church structures. So Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa was a four square church before that. But, you know, they started communes and coffee houses, and I don't think we're going to follow. Again, it, history doesn't repeat itself, it just rhymes. But I do believe that we're seeing a generation that is real. I was talking to Matt Chandler the other day um, about this, and he says, Ed, we're seeing more people come to Christ now than we've seen in the history of our church. And it's not everywhere. Still, people are so, still unsure in some places. They got that one easy excuse that they need. But I believe if we will emphasize our ecclesiology. The church is not some unnecessary appendage in the mission of God, right? The kingdom of God births the church in its wake. Ephesians 3.10 says God has chosen the church to make known his manifold wisdom. It is the tool, it is the instrument, and double down on the church, sisters and brothers. Double down on it. Um, I know it's been a tough year. I know people are divided and more. And I think part of the double down in the church needs to say to people, stop sorting yourselves ideologically out of the church community. Let me give you an example. Um, let me give you the example of Andy Stanley because he's always doing something kind of controversial. He was on the Twitters doing something this week controversial too. Um, so, I mean, if you know Andy Stanley, you know, you remember when he said, oh, got to unhitch from the Old Testament and that got everyone mad. How many of you saw that? Did you see that? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so that's okay. And then he used this example of a same-sex couple in a sermon, um, and people got mad. Um, and by the way, he's, he's, uh, he's, has no, he's orthodox on, on sexuality, that example aside. Um, I've, you know, we've asked him. Um, but the thing that I thought was fascinating was, he, he, I mean, if you stuck with Andy Stanley through the example of a same-sex couple, unhitched from the Old Testament, and several other things Andy had just said controversial over the years. So when he announced in summer of 2020 that they were going to shut down and not have public worship, it was really hard to be a megachurch in 2020. So they were going to shut down and not have public worship at the end of the year. He writes about this in his new book, Not In It to Win It. His new book will be out in uh, May. I, I've read of uh, Advanced Reader's Copy. And he says in there, and I don't remember the exact number, but something like when he announced that, like 10 to 15% of his church left that day and sent him letters on the way out, which I'm like, okay, okay. I'm okay with people disagreeing, but you didn't leave when Andy Stanley said unhitch from the Old Testament. You didn't leave when he said seven other super controversial things. But when he did something that a large percentage of large churches did, you're like, I'm out, that's it, I... This was too much. Streaming for the next six months and meeting in small communities instead of the larger group was too much. Here's the thing I want you to see. 
everybody's on edge. You know that. You feel that. He feels that. He, he writes about it in the new book. I feel that. Uh, when I mentioned when Darren Patrick died, we were working 24-7. That's too much. We were working 16-hour days, though. And I had to step back. I wept. I, and I, I deeply grieved Darren's loss. We talked two days before he died. I deeply grieved his loss. But there was something more. It just, there was too much. I went to my doctor and said, I've, I've always been a mental health advocate because of an aunt who, who died by suicide and, and was brilliant and deeply mentally ill. And I had not, you know, not engaged medical professional before. And I said, doctor, I, I'm dealing with levels of anxiety that are impacting me, impacting the way I relate to others. And, and he, he basically said, we're going to do this, put me on a different diet. Uh, some of you know, so I've lost some weight um, and done the exercise. And I was able to get back to a sense of balance. But I want you to hear, 2020 and 2021 knocked a lot of us out of balance. And I bet it did you too. So it's impacting you, but lastly, it's impacting the world. The tumult and turbulence. So if it feels like 1968, because it's a lot like 1968. But in 1968, the Holy Spirit was on the move in a way unlike we have seen in decades. Unlike since we've seen since the beginning of the 1900s with Azusa Street and the Pentecostal movement. Now, none of, most of us aren't. Are there any of you like call yourself or think of yourselves as Pentecostals, Charismatics? Just ra raise both hands. There you go. All right, just a few of you do. Okay. I mean, that's, that's literally 600 million Christians around the world now. And it started following a financial crisis that broke everything in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Inflation at record levels, uh, wars soon starting and more. The world was on fire and the Holy Spirit was on the move. 1968, the world was on fire and the Holy Spirit's on the move. And I believe that the Lord's on the move today. So my encouragement to you, and I'm going to pray for you, my encouragement to you is to, again, build reservoirs of resilience because the cultural convulsion probably won't last forever. They tend to resolve a truce comes, a truce came by the 60s, uh, out of the 60s into the 70s. Um, in the early 1900s, you know, we, we, the truce came. Um, but still, you're going to need reservoirs of resilience probably for two to three more years. And ongoing, but two to three more hard years culturally are before us. So I, I don't want to discourage you, but I encourage you. But Jesus is enough. His spirit is at work. You have sisters and brothers who are here to help you if that's what you need relationally and to support you through Converge, through this district and more. It's a healthy district, ready to engage. And you have Christian counselors and more if you need more help than that. Engage those things. And if the church is struggling, the world is struggling even more. And therein is the good news of the gospel opportunity. Let's make much of Jesus when the world is on fire. And I believe the Lord will be on it. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for these women and these men. I thank you for how you have worked through this district, these churches, and more. Father, I pray that you would give us guidance and direction, um, guidance and direction about what it means to walk through some of these difficult times. Give us reservoirs of resilience, community of pastors and leaders. And if we need more help, give us the humility and the courage to seek it. And Father, I pray that we'd see an outpouring of your Holy Spirit these days. That we'd look back three or four years from now and say, oh, in 2022, we began to see it and there was a harvest that took place. So Father, thank you for Paul. Thank you for the church planners we've heard from. Thank you for the leaders that care about one another here. May you be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we want to pray for Ed and uh, just his ministry. We thank you so much for the insight that you have given him into our culture and how we can, as a church, uh, just invade that culture and <laughs> in a good way, uh, just to infect it with the gospel and to, uh, and to do all that we can to build your kingdom in the darkness. Lord, we know that you're at work, and I pray for Ed that you'll protect him. I know the enemy would love to take him out one way or another, uh, whether it's a physical illness or, or uh, just the, the persecution he sometimes gets or... Uh, just help him to continue to stand strong for the truth. Give him wisdom. Give him insight when he's maybe uh, uh, getting off course a little bit. The Holy Spirit, just convict him and move him back where he belongs. But he's such a great spokesperson uh, in, in trying to keep the church on course uh, so that we can be incredibly effective for your kingdom. And so, Lord, we just love him. We thank you that, that he gave his time for us this weekend and, and just continue to bless his life in big ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ed is, uh, Ed is leaving. Gonna go do a
He's doing a little podcast. He's doing a highly touted national a radio podcast, broadcast. A little podcast. And you'll also want to catch him. He's got a new woodworking show on the Magnolia Network. I do, I do. He's so you can find that in the TV guide uh, wow, near TV you. TV guide. And He's so, dating uh, himself right there. 